The Dialectic of Sex The Case for Feminist Revolution 1970 By Shulamith Firestone Chapter 3 Freudianism, The Misguided Feminism If we had to name the one cultural current that most characterizes America in the 20th century, it might be the work of Freud and the disciplines that grew out of it. There is no one who remains unexposed to his vision of human life, whether through courses in it, psych, through personal therapy, a common cultural experience for children of the middle class, or generally, through its pervasion of popular culture. The new vocabulary has crept into our everyday speech, so that the ordinary man thinks in terms of being sick, neurotic, or psycho, he checks his ID periodically for a death wish, and his ego for weakness, people who reject him are egocentric, he takes for granted that he has a castration complex, that he has repressed a desire to sleep with his mother, that he was and maybe still is engaged in sibling rivalry, that women envy his penis, he is likely to see every banana or hot dog as a phallic symbol. His marital arguments and divorce court proceedings are conducted in this psychoanalyse. Most of the time he is unclear about what these terms mean, but if he doesn't know, at least he is certain that his shrink does. The spectacled and goateed little Viennese dozing in his armchair is a cliché of, nervous, modern humour. It would take some time to tabulate the number of cartoons that refer to psychoanalysis. We have built a whole new symbology around the couch alone. Freudianism has become, with its confessionals and penance, its proselytes and converts, with the millions spent on its upkeep, our modern church. We attack it only uneasily, for you never know, on the day of final judgment, whether they might be right. Who can be sure that he is as healthy as he can get? Who is functioning at his highest capacity? And who not scared out of his wits? Who doesn't hate his mother and father? Who doesn't compete with his brother? What girl at some time did not wish she were a boy? And for those hardy souls who persist in their skepticism, there is always that dreadful word resistance. They are the ones who are sickest, it's obvious, they fight it so much. There has been a backlash. Books have been written, careers have bloomed, on the contradictions within Freud's work alone, some have made a name for themselves simply on one small section of his work, for example, by disproving the death wish, or penis envy, and others, braver, or more ambitious, have attacked the absurdities of the whole. Critical theories abound at every cocktail party, some intellectuals go so far as to relate the demise of the intellectual community in America to the importation of psychoanalysis. In opposition to the religiosity of Freudianism, a whole empirical school of behaviorism has been founded, though experimental psychology suffers from its own kind of bias. And gradually, with all this, Freudian thought has been unwound, its most essential tenets sloughed off one by one until there is nothing left to attack. And yet it does not die. Though psychoanalytic therapy has been proven ineffective, and Freud's ideas about women's sexuality literally proven wrong, for example, Masters and Johnson on the myth of the double orgasm, the old conceptions still circulate. The doctors go on practicing. And at the end of each new critique we find a guilty peon to the great father who started it all. They can't quite do him in. But I don't think it is solely a lack of courage to admit after all these years that the emperor had no clothes on. I don't think it is entirely because they might work themselves out of a job. I think that in most cases it is the same integrity that made them question it all that keeps them from destroying it all. Intuitively their conscience tells them they dare not drop that final axe. For while it is true that Freud's theories are not verifiable empirically, that Freudianism in clinical practice has led to real absurdities, that in fact as early as 1913 it was noted that psychoanalysis itself is the disease it purports to cure creating a new neurosis in place of the old, we have all observed that those undergoing therapy seem more preoccupied with themselves than ever before, having advanced to a state of perceptive neurosis now, replete with regressions, lovesick transferences, and agonized soliloquies, still we sense there is something to it. Though those undergoing therapy are overcome with confusion when asked point-blank does it help? Or is it worth it? It can't be dismissed entirely. Freud captured the imagination of a whole continent and civilization for a good reason. Though on the surface inconsistent, illogical, or way out, his followers, with their cautious logic, their experiments and revisions have nothing comparable to say. Freudianism is so charged, 
so impossible to repudiate because Freud grasped the crucial problem of modern life, sexuality. Section 1 The Common Roots of Freudianism and Feminism 1. Freudianism and feminism grew from the same soil. It is no accident that Freud began his work at the height of the early feminist movement. We underestimate today how important feminist ideas were at the time. The parlor conversations about the nature of men and women, the possibility of artificial reproduction, babies in glass bottles, recorded in D. H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover were not imaginary. Sexism was the hottest topic of the day, Lawrence was merely picking up on it, adding his own views. Sexism also determined nearly the whole of G. B. Shaw's material. Ibsen's Nora in the Doll's House was no freak, such arguments were splitting up many real-life marriages. Henry James's nasty description of feminist women in the Bostonians and Virginia Woolf's more sympathetic ones in the years and night and day were drawn from real life. The culture reflected prevailing attitudes and concerns. Feminism was an important literary theme because it was then a vital problem. For writers wrote about what they saw, they described the cultural milieu around them. And in this milieu there was concern for the issues of feminism. The question of the emancipation of women affected every woman, whether she developed through the new ideas or fought them desperately. Old films of the time show the growing solidarity of women, reflecting their unpredictable behavior, their terrifying and often disastrous testing of sex roles. No one remained untouched by the upheaval. And this was not only in the West, Russia at this time was experimenting at doing away with the family. At the turn of the century, then, in social and political thinking, in literary and artistic culture, there was a tremendous ferment of ideas regarding sexuality, marriage and family, and women's role. Freudianism was only one of the cultural products of this ferment. Both Freudianism and feminism came as reactions to one of the smuggest periods in Western civilization, the Victorian era, characterized by its family-centeredness, and thus its exaggerated sexual oppression and repression. Both movements signified awakening, but Freud was merely a diagnostician for what feminism purports to cure. 2. Freudianism and feminism are made of the same stuff. Freud's achievement was the rediscovery of sexuality. Freud saw sexuality as the prime life force, the way in which this libido was organized in the child determined the psychology of the individual, which, moreover, recreated that of the historic species. He found that in order to adjust to present civilization the sexual being must undergo a repression process in childhood. While every individual undergoes this repression, some undergo it less successfully than others, producing greater, psychosis, or lesser, neurosis, maladjustment, often severe enough to cripple the individual altogether. Freud's proposed remedy is less significant, and indeed has caused actual damage by a process of bringing to the surface the crippling repressions, of conscious recognition and open examination, the patient is supposed to be able to come to terms with, to consciously reject, rather than subconsciously repress, the troubling wishes of the ID. This therapy process is entered into with the help of a psychoanalyst through transference, in which the psychoanalyst substitutes for the original authority figure at the origins of the repressive neurosis. Like religious healing or hypnosis, which, indeed, Freud studied and was much influenced by, transference proceeds by emotional involvement rather than by reason. The patient falls in love with his analyst, by projecting the problem onto the supposedly blank page of the therapeutic relationship, he draws it out in order to be cured of it. Only it doesn't work. For Freud, in the tradition of pure science, observed psychological structures without ever questioning their social context. Given his own psychic structure and cultural prejudices, he was a petty tyrant of the old school, for whom certain sexual truths may have been expensive, he can hardly have been expected to make such an examination part of his life work. Wilhelm Reich was one of the few who followed that path, in addition, just as Marx could not take fully into account the future advent of cybernetics. Freud then did not have the mind-bending knowledge of technological possibility that we now have. But whether or not we can blame Freud personally, his failure to question society itself was responsible for massive confusion in the disciplines that grew up around this theory. Beset with the insurmountable problems that resulted from trying to put into practice a basic contradiction, the resolution of a problem within the environment that created it, his followers began to attack one component after another of his theory, until they had thrown the baby out with the bath. 
But was there any value in these ideas? Let us re-examine some of them once again, this time from a radical feminist view. I believe Freud was talking about something real, though perhaps his ideas, taken literally, lead to absurdity, for his genius was poetic rather than scientific, his ideas are more valuable as metaphors than as literal truths. In this light let us first examine the Oedipus complex, a cornerstone of Freudian theory, in which the male child is said to want to possess his mother sexually and to kill his father, fear of castration by the father forcing him to repress this wish. Freud himself said in his last book, I venture to assert that if psychoanalysis could boast of no other achievement than the discovery of the repressed Oedipus complex, that alone would give a claim to be counted among the precious new acquisitions of mankind. Contrast this with Andrew Salter in the case against psychoanalysis. Quotation from Andrew Salter Even those most sympathetic to Freud find the contradictions in the Oedipus complex somewhat confusing. Says the Psychiatric Dictionary of the Passing of the Oedipus Complex, the fate of the Oedipus Complex is not yet clearly understood. I think we can talk with certainty about the fate of the Oedipus Complex. The fate of the Oedipus complex will be the fate of alchemy, phrenology, and palmistry. The fate of the Oedipus complex will be oblivion. End of quotation from Andrew Salter For Salter is plagued by all the usual contradictions in a theory that assumes the social context, the cause of the complex, to be immutable. Quotation from Andrew Salter Freud's thought about the normal disappearance of the Oedipus complex suffers from a critical inconsistency in logic. If we grant that the disappearance of the Oedipus complex is achieved through castration fear, does it not appear as if normality is acquired as a result of fear and repression exerted on the boy? And is not the achievement of mental health by repression in flagrant contradiction of the most elementary Freudian doctrines? End of quotation from Andrew Salter I submit that the only way that the Oedipus complex can make full sense is in terms of power. We must keep in mind that Freud observed this complex as common to every normal individual who grows up in the nuclear family of a patriarchal society, a form of social organization that intensifies the worst effects of the inequalities inherent in the biological family itself. There is some evidence to prove that the effects of the Oedipus complex decrease in societies where males hold less power, and that the weakening of patriarchalism produces many cultural changes that perhaps can be traced to this relaxation. Let us take a look at this patriarchal nuclear family in which the Oedipus complex appears so markedly. In the prototypical family of this kind the man is the breadwinner, all other members of this family are thus his dependents. He agrees to support a wife in return for her services, housekeeping, sex, and reproduction. The children whom she bears for him are even more dependent. They are legally the property of the father. One of the first campaigns of the early women's rights movement was against the deprivation of women, upon divorce, of their children, whose duty it is to feed them and educate them, to mold them to take their place in whatever class of society to which he belongs. In return for this he expects that continuation of name and property which is often confused with immortality. His rights over them are complete. If he is not a kind father slash master, tough luck. They cannot escape his clutches until they are grown, and by then the psychological molding has been accomplished, they are now ready to repeat his performance. It is important to remember that more recent versions of the nuclear family, though they may blur this essential relationship beyond recognition, reproduce essentially the same triangle of dependencies, father, mother, son. For even if the woman is equally educated, even when she is working, we need to be reminded that until the hard-won advances of the women's rights movement of Freud's time women were not educated, nor could they find jobs, she is rarely able, given the inequality of the job market, to make as much money as her husband, and woe betide the marriage in which she does. But even if she could, later, when she bears children and takes care of infants, she is once again totally incapacitated. To make both women and children totally independent would be to eliminate not just the patriarchal nuclear family, but the biological family itself. This then is the oppressive climate in which the normal child grows up. From the beginning he is sensitive to the hierarchy of power. He knows that in every way, physically, economically, emotionally, he is completely dependent on, thus at the mercy of his two parents, 
whoever they may be. Between the two of them, though, he will certainly prefer his mother. He has a bond with her in oppression, while he is oppressed by both parents, she, at least, is oppressed by one. The father, so far as the child can see, is in total control. Just you wait till your father gets home from the office. Boy, will you get a spanking? The child then senses that his mother is halfway between authority and helplessness. He can run to his father if his mother tries anything unjust, but if his father beats him there is little his mother can offer except tea and sympathy. If his mother is sensitive to injustice, she may use her wiles and tears to spare him. But he uses wiles and tears himself at that age, and he knows that tears don't compare to solid force. Their effectiveness, at any rate, is limited, dependent on many variables, bad day at the office. Whereas physical force or the threat of it is a sure bet. In the traditional family there exists a parental polarity, the mother is expected to love the child devotedly, even unconditionally, whereas the father, on the other hand, seldom takes an active interest in infants, certainly not in their intimate care, and later, when the son is older, loves him conditionally, in response to performance and achievement. Eric from In the Art of Loving Quotation by Eric from we have already spoken about motherly love. Motherly love is by its very nature unconditional. Mother loves the newborn infant because it is her child, not because the child has fulfilled any specific condition, or lived up to any specific expectation, the relationship to the father is quite different. Mother is the home we come from, she is nature, soil, the ocean, father does not represent any such natural home. He has little connection with the child in the first years of its life, and his importance for the child in this early period cannot be compared with that of the mother. But while father does not represent the natural world, he represents the other pole of human existence, the world of thought, of man-made things, of law and order, of discipline, of travel and adventure. Father is the one who teaches the child, who shows him the road into the world, fatherly love is conditional love. Its principle is I love you because you fulfill my expectations, because you do your duty, because you are like me. In this development from mother-centered to father-centered attachment, and their eventual synthesis, lies the basis for mental health and the achievement of maturity. End of quotation by Eric Fromm If this were not the case when he wrote it, it certainly would be by now. Fromm's book on love has been translated into 17 languages, selling, as it says on the jacket, 1,500,000 copies in English alone. Later on I shall deal in greater detail with the nature of mother love that such a quote espouses, and the kind of damage such an ideal does to both mother and child. Here I'll try to show only in what way this traditional polarity relates to the Oedipus complex. Freud, unlike others, did not underestimate what goes on in a child before the age of six. If an infant's basic needs are taken care of by his mother, if he is fed, dressed, and coddled by her, if he is loved by her unconditionally as opposed to conditionally by his father, seldom seeing him and then only for punishment or manly approval dash and if moreover he senses that he and his mother are united against the more powerful father whom they both must please and appease, then it is true that every normal male first identifies with the female. As for desiring his mother, yes, this too. But it is absurd what Freud's literalism can lead to. The child does not actively dream of penetrating his mother. Chances are he cannot yet even imagine how one would go about such an act. Nor is he physically developed enough to have a need for orgasmic release. It would be more correct to view this sexual need in a generalized, more negative fashion, that is, only later, due to the structuring of the family around the incest taboo, must the sexual separate from other kinds of physical and emotional responses. At first they are integrated. What happens at the age of six when the boy is suddenly expected to start shaping up, acting like a little man? Words like male identification and father image are thrown around. Last year's cuddly toys are snatched away. He is led out to start playing baseball. Trucks and electric trains multiply. If he cries he is called a sissy, if he runs to his mother, a mama's boy. Father suddenly takes an active interest in him, you spoiled him. The boy fears his father, rightly. He knows that between the two of them, his mother is far more on his side. In most cases he has already observed very clearly that his father makes his mother unhappy, makes her cry, doesn't talk to her very much, argues with her a lot, bullies, this is why, if he has seen intercourse, 
he is likely to interpret it on the basis of what he has already gathered of the relationship, that is, that his father is attacking his mother. However, suddenly now he's expected to identify with this brutish stranger. Of course he doesn't want to. He resists. He starts dreaming of boogeyman. He becomes afraid of his shadow. He cries when he goes to the barber. He expects his father to cut off his penis, he's not behaving like the little man he had better learn to be. This is his difficult transitional phase. What finally convinces the normal child to reverse his identification? Fromm puts it so well. Quotation by Fromm But while father does not represent the natural world, he represents the other pole of human existence, the world of thought, of man-made things, of law and order, of discipline, of travel and adventure. Father is the one who teaches the child, who shows him the road into the world. End of quotation by Fromm What finally convinces him is the offer of the world when he grows up. He is asked to make a transition from the state of the powerless, women and children, to the state of the potentially powerful, son, ego extension, of his father. Most children aren't fools. They don't plan to be stuck with the lousy limited lives of women. They want that travel and adventure. But it is hard. Because deep down they have a contempt for the father with all his power. They sympathize with their mother. But what can they do? They repress their deep emotional attachment to their mother, repress their desire to kill their father, and emerge into the honorable state of manhood. It is no wonder that such a transition leaves an emotional residue, a complex. The male child, in order to save his own hide, has had to abandon and betray his mother and join ranks with her oppressor. He feels guilty. His emotions towards women in general are affected. Most men have made an all too beautiful transition into power over others, some are still trying. Other components of Freudian theory open up just as well when examined in power, i.e. political terms, the antidote of feminism cancels the sex bias that produced the initial distortion. It is generally believed that the Electra complex is less profound a discovery than the Oedipus complex, because, like all Freud's theories about women, it analyzes the female only as negative male, the Electra complex is an inverse Oedipus complex. The Electra complex, with its interwoven castration complex, is briefly as follows, the little girl, just like the little boy, begins with a fixation on the mother. Towards the age of five, when she discovers that she has no penis, she begins to feel castrated. To compensate, she tries to make an alliance with her father through seduction, thus developing a rivalry with, and a subsequent hostility to, her mother. The superego develops in response to repression by the father, but because he is the object of her seduction, he does not repress her as he does his son, who is his sexual rival for the affection of the mother, and thus the young girl's basic psychic organization differs from, is weaker than, that of her brother. A girl who persists in strongly identifying with her father is said to be retarded at the clitoral stage of female sexuality, likely to be frigid or a lesbian. The most remarkable feature of this description, restated in feminist terms, is that the little girl, also, is first attached to her mother, which, incidentally, disproved a biologically determined heterosexuality. Like the little boy, the little girl loves her mother more than her father, and for precisely the same reasons, the mother cares for her more closely than the father, and shares her oppression with her. At about the age of five, along with the boy, she consciously begins to observe the father's greater power, his access to that interesting wider world that is denied her mother. At this point she rejects her mother as dull and familiar, and begins to identify with her father. The situation is complicated further if she has brothers, for then she observes that the father is more than willing to allow her brother to share his world, his power, and yet that world is still denied her. She now has two alternatives, one, realistically sizing up the situation, she can start using female wiles for all their worth in the attempt to rob the father of his power, she will then have to compete with her mother for the favors of the powerful, or, two, she can refuse to believe that the physical difference between her and her brother will forever imply a corresponding power inequity. In this case she rejects everything identified with her mother, i.e. servility and wiles, the psychology of the oppressed, and imitates doggedly everything she has seen her brother do that gains for him the kind of freedom and approval she is seeking. Notice I do not say she pretends masculinity. These traits are not sexually determined, 
but though she tries desperately to gain her father's favor by behaving more and more in the manner in which he has openly encouraged her brother to behave, it doesn't work for her. She tries harder. She becomes a tomboy, and is flattered to be called one. This obstinacy in the face of an unpalatable reality may even succeed. For a time. Until puberty perhaps. Then she is really stuck. She can no longer deny her sex, it is confirmed by lustful males all around her. This is when she often develops a female identification, with a vengeance. Teenage girls, so difficult, secretive, giggly, with boys it's the brat stage. As for the penis envy, again it is safer to view this as a metaphor. Even when an actual preoccupation with genitals does occur it is clear that anything that physically distinguishes the envied male will be envied. For the girl can't really understand how it is that when she does exactly the same thing as her brother, his behavior is approved and hers isn't. She may or may not make a confused connection between his behavior and the organ that differentiates him. Her hostility towards her mother is, again, only possibly tied up with an observed genital similarity. Anything that identifies her with the mother she is trying so hard to reject is also rejected. But that a small girl on her own will see herself as of the same sex as her mother is much less likely than that she will see herself as asexual. She may even be proud of it. After all, she has no obvious protrusions, like the breasts that mark the female for her. And as for her genitals, her innocent slit appears to bear no resemblance to the hairy man that her mother has, she is seldom even aware that she has a vagina because it is sealed. Her body as yet is as limber and functional as her brother's, and she is at one with it, they are only equally oppressed by the greater strength of adults. Without specific direction, she could fool herself a long time that she will not end up like her mother. This is why she is so encouraged to play with dolls, to play house, to be pretty and attractive. It is hoped that she will not be one of those to fight off her role till the last minute. It is hoped she will slip into it early, by persuasion, artificially, rather than by necessity, that the abstract promise of a baby will be enough of a lure to substitute for that exciting world of travel and adventure. In the light of this feminist interpretation, many peripheral Freudian doctrines that had seemed absurd now make sense. For example, Ernest Jones, in Papers on Psychoanalysis, Quotation by Ernest Jones With very many children there is a lively desire to become the parents of their own parents. This curious construction of the imagination, is evidently closely connected with incestuous wishes, since it is an exaggerated form of the commoner desire to be one's own father. End of quotation by Ernest Jones Feminist translation, children fantasy being in a position of power over their parent masters, particularly the one who has really got the power, father. Or, here is Freud on fetishism, the object is the substitute for the mother's phallus which the little boy believed in and does not wish to forego. Really, Freud can be embarrassing. Wouldn't it be a lot more sensible to talk about the mother's power? Chances are the little boy has not even seen his mother undressed, let alone closely observed the difference between the penis and the clitoris. What he does not know is that he is attached to his mother and does not want to reject her on the grounds of her powerlessness. The chosen object is merely the symbol of this attachment. Other such examples are abundant, but I have made my point, with a feminist analysis the whole structure of Freudianism, for the first time, makes thorough sense clarifying such important related areas as homosexuality, even the nature of the repressive incest taboo itself, two causally related subjects which have been labored for a long time with little unanimity. We can understand them, finally, only as symptoms of the power psychology created by the family. Durkheim, at the turn of the century, with his foundation work on incest, like Freud, triggered off a train of contradictory opinion that has lasted till our present day. Durkheim thought that the incest taboo originated in the structure of the clan. Quotation by Durkheim Many facts tend to prove that at the beginning of human societies, incest was not forbidden until division into at least two primary clans, for the first form of this prohibition that we know, namely exogamy, seems above all to be correlative to this organization. The latter is certainly not primitive. As the basic structure of the clan was a stage through which all human societies seem to have passed, 
and exogamy was strictly linked to the constitution of the clan, it is not surprising that the moral state the clan inspired and left behind it was itself general throughout humanity. At least it was necessary in order to triumph over it, to have particularly pressing social necessities, and this explains both how incest was legitimized among certain peoples and why these people remained the exception. End of quotation by Durkheim Once the family had become the center of religious moralism, and all free passions had come to be tied up outside it, with women and sex, the taboo against incest became firmly established, self-perpetuating. Quotation by Durkheim For by the time the origins of this duality, between morality and passion, disappeared, it was firmly entrenched in the culture. The entire moral life had been organized as a result of this development, it would have been necessary to overthrow the whole morality to return to the previous status. End of quotation by Durkheim Durkheim adds, strikingly, without the origins in exogamy, passion and love between the sexes would not have become synonymous. So that to eliminate the incest taboo we would have to eliminate the family, and sexuality as it is now structured. Not such a bad idea. For this traditional and by now almost universal prescription on incest has caused us to accept as normal a sexuality in which individual potential remains unfulfilled. Freud described the psychological penalties of sexual repression caused by the incest taboo, discovering particularly the existence of the Oedipus complex in every normal male child, and its counterpart, the Electra, in every normal female. Homosexuality is only what happens when these repressions don't take as they ought to, that is, rather than being thoroughly suppressed, allowing the individual to at least function in society, they remain on the surface, seriously crippling that individual's sexual relationships, or even his total psyche. A system in which the first person to whom the child responds emotionally will require of him that he repress a substantial part of those responses is bound to misfire most of the time. As Ruth Hirschberger notes in Adam's Rib, Quotation by Hirschberger It is significant that the same woman who awakens the boy's affection, and few deny the sexual component in all demonstrativeness, is also the first to issue the taboo against his sexuality. Suppression of sexuality becomes the ticket to the mother's affection. End of quotation by Hirschberger Or Male homosexuality could result from the refusal by the child at five or six to make the transition from mother-centeredness to father-centeredness dash often from a genuine love for the mother and a real contempt for the father. In the case of the missing father figure, such a transition is never clearly demanded of the child, very often, it is true, given the war between the sexes as it presents itself in most marriages, the mother encourages such an attachment out of spite to get even with the father by denying him the progeny for the sake of which he tolerates her. But I think it would be more accurate to say that the child has simply taken the place of the indifferent, often philandering father in her affections. Every mother, even the most well-adjusted, is expected to make motherhood a central focus of her life. Often the child is her only substitute for all that she has been denied in the larger world, in Freud's terms, her penis substitute. How can we then demand that she not be possessive, that she give up suddenly? without a struggle, to the world of travel and adventure dash the very son who was meant to compensate her for her lifelong loss of this world. Female homosexuality, though it too has its sources in unsuccessful repression, the Electra complex, is considerably more complicated. Remember that the little girl also is first attached to her mother. She may never, out of later rivalry, learn to repress this attachment. Or she may attempt to act like a boy also in order to win her mother's approval. Unfortunately women, too, prefer male children. Conversely, in cases where she does identify very strongly with her father, she may refuse to give up the desired male privilege even beyond puberty. In extreme cases she imagines herself really to be the male whose part she is playing. And even those women who appear to be sexually adjusted seldom really are. We must remember that a woman can go through intercourse with almost no response, a man can't. Though few women, due to the excessive pressure on them to conform, actually repudiate their sexual role altogether by becoming actively lesbian, this does not mean that most women are sexually fulfilled by interaction with men. 
However, a damaged female's sexuality is relatively harmless in social terms, whereas the male sexual sickness, the confusion of sexuality with power, hurts others. This is one reason why in Victorian society as well as a long time before and after, including today, women's interest in sex is less than men's. This fact is so bafflingly obvious that it led a well-known psychoanalyst, Theodore Rake, to conclude, in 1966, that the very sexual drive itself is masculine, even in women, because on a lower evolutionary level reproduction is possible without males. Thus we see that in a family-based society, repressions due to the incest taboo make a totally fulfilled sexuality impossible for anyone, and a well-functioning sexuality possible for only a few. Homosexuals in our time are only the extreme casualties of the system of obstructed sexuality that develops in the family. But though homosexuality at present is as limited and sick as our heterosexuality, a day may soon come in which a healthy transsexuality would be the norm. For if we grant that the sexual drive is at birth diffuse and undifferentiated from the total personality, Freud's polymorphous perversity, and, as we have seen, becomes differentiated only in response to the incest taboo, and that, furthermore, the incest taboo is now necessary only in order to preserve the family, then if we did away with the family we would in effect be doing away with the repressions that mold sexuality into specific formations. All other things being equal, people might still prefer those of the opposite sex simply because it is physically more convenient. But even this is a large assumption. For if sexuality were indeed at no time separated from other responses, if one individual responded to the other in a total way that merely included sexuality as one of its components, then it is unlikely that a purely physical factor could be decisive. However, we have no way of knowing that now. The end of the compartmentalization of personality through reintegration of the sexual with the whole could have important cultural side effects. At the present time the Oedipus complex, originating in the now almost universal incest taboo, demands that the child soon distinguish between the emotional and the sexual, one is considered by the father to be an appropriate response to the mother, the other is not. If the child is to gain his mother's love he must separate out the sexual from his other feelings, Freud's aim inhibited relationships. One cultural development that proceeds directly from such an unnatural psychological dichotomy is the good-slash-bad women syndrome, with which whole cultures are diseased. That is, the personality split is projected outwards onto the class women, those who resemble the mother are good, and consequently one must not have sexual feelings towards them, those unlike the mother, who don't call forth a total response, are sexual, and therefore bad. Whole classes of people, for example, prostitutes, pay with their lives for this dichotomy, others suffer to different degrees. A good portion of our language degrades women to the level where it is permissible to have sexual feelings for them. Cunt. Your brain is between your legs, this sexual schizophrenia is rarely overcome totally in the individual. And in the larger culture, whole historical developments, the history of art and literature itself, have been directly molded by it. Thus the courtly honor of the Middle Ages, exalting women only at the expense of their flesh and blood humanity, making sex a lowly act, divorced from true love, developed into Marcionism, the cult of the virgin in art and poetry. A song from the period illustrates the division. I care not for these ladies who must be wooed and prayed. Give me kind Amaryllis the wanton country made. Nature art disdaineth. Her beauty is her own. For when we hug and kiss she cries. Forsooth, let us go. But when we come where comfort is, she never will say no. The separation of sex from emotion is at the very foundations of Western culture and civilization. If early sexual repression is the basic mechanism by which character structures supporting political, ideological, and economic serfdom are produced, then an end to the incest taboo, through abolition of the family, would have profound effects, sexuality would be released from its straitjacket to eroticize our whole culture, changing its very definition. To summarize briefly my second point, that Freud and feminism dealt with the same material, Freud's fundamental hypothesis, 
the nature of the libido and its conflict with the reality principle, makes a great deal more sense when seen against the social backdrop of the patriarchal nuclear family. I have attempted to reanalyze in feminist terms those components of Freud's theory that most directly relate to sexuality and its repression within the family system, the incest taboo and the resulting Oedipus and Electra complexes, and their common misfiring into sexual malfunctioning, or, in severe cases, into what is now sexual deviation. I have pointed out that this sexual repression, demanded of every individual in the interests of family integrity, makes not only for individual neurosis, but also for widespread cultural illnesses. Admittedly more than a sketchy presentation is beyond the scope of this chapter, a thorough restatement of Freud in feminist terms would make a valuable book in itself. Here I have submitted only that Freudianism and feminism sprang up at the same time, in response to the same stimuli, and that essentially they are made of the same substance. In carefully examining the basic tenets of Freudianism, I have shown that these are also the raw material of feminism. The difference lies only in that radical feminism does not accept the social context in which repression, and the resulting neurosis, must develop as immutable. If we dismantle the family, the subjection of pleasure to reality, i.e. sexual repression, has lost its function, and is no longer necessary. Section 2 Freudianism subsumes feminism. To the two main points of this chapter, first, that Freudianism and feminism grew out of the same historical conditions, and second, that Freudianism and feminism are based on the same set of realities, I shall add a third, Freudianism subsumed the place of feminism as the lesser of two evils. We have shown how Freudianism hit the same nerve that feminism did. Both at once were responses to centuries of increasing privatization of family life, its extreme subjugation of women, and the sex repressions and subsequent neuroses this caused. Freud too was once considered a sex maniac, destructive to society, he was ridiculed and despised as much as were the militant feminists. It was only much later that Freudianism became as sacred as an established religion. How did this reversal come about? Let us first consider the social context of the development of both feminism and Freudianism. We have seen that the ideas of the early radical feminists contained the seeds of the coming sexual revolution. We have seen that though in many cases the feminists themselves did not clearly grasp the importance of what they had stumbled into, though often they did not have down a thorough and consistent radical feminist critique of society, and given the political climate at that time, it is no wonder, the reaction of society to them indicates that their enemies knew what they were about, if they themselves weren't sure, the virulent anti-feminist literature of the time, often written by men well respected and honest in their own fields of endeavor, illustrates the threat the feminists presented to the establishment. I have also shown in the past chapter how the movement was redirected into an all-consuming effort to obtain the vote, and how in this way it was sidetracked and destroyed. Following the end of the feminist movement, with the granting of the vote, came the era of the flappers, an era that in its pseudo-liberated sexuality much resembles our own. The widespread female rebellion stirred up by the feminist movement now had nowhere to go. Girls who had cut their hair, shortened their skirts, and gone off to college no longer had a political direction for their frustration, instead they danced it away in marathons, or expended themselves swimming the channel and flying aeroplanes across the Atlantic. They were aroused class who did not know what to do with their consciousness. They were told then as we are still told now, you've got civil rights, short skirts, and sexual liberty. You've won your revolution. What more do you want? But the revolution had been won within a system organized around the patriarchal nuclear family. And as Herbert Marcuse and Eros and Civilization shows, within such a repressive structure only a more sophisticated repression can result, repressive desublimation. In a repressive society, individual happiness and productive development are in contradiction to society, if they are defined as values to be realized within the society, they become themselves repressive. The concept of repressive to sublimation is the release of sexuality in modes and forms which reduce and weaken erotic energy. In this process sexuality spreads into formerly tabooed dimensions and relations. However, Instead of recreating these dimensions and relations in the images of the pleasure principle, the opposite tendency asserts itself, the reality principle extends its hold over Eros. The most telling illustration is provided by the methodical introduction of sexiness into business, politics, propaganda, 
etc. Here in the twenties began the stereotypes of the American career girl, the co-ed, and the butchy businesswoman. This image of the supposedly liberated woman went around the world via Hollywood, the unbalancing effects on women of pseudo-liberation giving anti-feminists new ammunition, and further bolstering the resistance of the still openly male supremacist societies to setting their women free. We like our women the way they are, womanly. American servicemen came back from the Second World War with stories of those great continental women who still knew how to make a man feel good. The word castration began to circulate. And finally in America, in the 40s, Freudianism came in big. Meanwhile, Freudianism itself had undergone deep internal changes. Emphasis had shifted from the original psychoanalytic theory to clinical practice. In the final chapter of Eros and Civilization, Marcuse discusses the reactionary implications of this shift, showing how the contradiction between Freud's ideas and the possibility of any effective therapy based on them, psychoanalysis cannot affect individual happiness in a society the structure of which can tolerate no more than severely controlled individual happiness, finally caused the assimilation of the theory to suit the practice. Quotation by Marcuse the most speculative and metaphysical concepts not subject to clinical verification, were minimized and discarded altogether. Moreover, in the process, some of Freud's most decisive concepts, such as the relation between the ID and the ego, the function of the unconscious, and the scope and significance of sexuality, were redefined in such a way that their explosive content was all but eliminated. The revisionists have converted the weakening of Freud's theory into a new theory. End of quotation by Marcuse. The term that perhaps best characterizes this neo-Freudian revisionism is adjustment. But adjustment to what? The underlying assumption is that one must accept the reality in which one finds oneself. But what happens if one is a woman, a black, or a member of any other especially unfortunate class of society? Then one is doubly unlucky. Then one not only has to achieve a normalcy that even for the privileged is, as we have shown, difficult and precarious at best, but one must also adjust to the specific racism or sexism that limits one's potential from the very beginning. One must abandon all attempts at self-definition or determination. Thus, in Marcuse's view, the process of therapy becomes merely a course in resignation, the difference between health and neurosis only the degree and effectiveness of the resignation. For, as in the often quoted statement of Freud to his patient, studies in hysteria, 1895, a great deal will be gained if we succeed through therapy in transforming your hysterical misery into everyday unhappiness. And as all those who have undergone therapy can attest, that's just about the size of it. Cleaver's description of his analysis in Solonice speaks for the experience of any other oppressed person as well. Quotation by Cleaver I had several sessions with a psychiatrist. His conclusion was that I hated my mother. How he arrived at this conclusion I'll never know because he knew nothing about my mother, and when he'd ask me questions I would answer him with absurd lies. What revolted me about him was that he had heard me denouncing whites, yet each time he deliberately guided the conversation back to my family life, to my childhood. That in itself was all right, but he deliberately blocked all my attempts to bring out the racial question, and he made it clear that he was not interested in my attitudes towards whites. This was a Pandora's box he did not care to open. End of quotation by Cleaver Theodore Ake, perhaps the prototype of the Cracker Barrel layman's Freud, exemplifies the crassness and insensitivity of most psychoanalysts to the real problems of their patients. It is remarkable that, with so many writings on the emotional differences between men and women, Rake should never have discovered the objective difference in their social situations. For example, he observes in passing differences like the following without ever drawing the right conclusions. Quotation from Theodore Ake Little girls sometimes whisper to each other men do this or that. Little boys almost never speak of women in this way. A woman gives much more thought to being a woman than a man to being a man. Most women, when they ask a favor of a man, smile. In the same situation men rarely smile. To be a ladies man means somewhere not to be much of a man. 
Almost all women are afraid that the man they love will leave them. But hardly a man is afraid that a woman will leave him. Women in groups sometimes say, My lord and master let me out of the house tonight. Men say, My ball and chain. End of quotation from Theodoric. And here is a random sampling of his neo-Freudian contributions to sexual understanding. Quotation from Rake. The first impression one gets of a young woman entering a room full of people is that of concealed or well-disguised insecurity. It seems that being the possessor of a penis protects men against such over-self-awareness. Men are not at home in the universe and therefore have to explore it. Women who form the chain of all organic beings are at home in the world and do not feel the urge to find out all about it. It seems to me that psychoanalytic research in emphasizing the physical deficiency in the genitals region which the little girl experiences has neglected the aesthetic value and its significance in the development of the feminine attitude. I assume that the little girl who compares her genitals to those of the little boy finds her own ugly. Not only the greater modesty of women, but their never ceasing striving towards beautifying and adorning their bodies is to be understood as displacement and extension of their effort to overcompensate for their original impression that their genitals are ugly. I believe that cleanliness has a double origin, the first in the taboos of tribes, and the second another matter coming thousands of years later, namely in women's awareness of their own odor, specifically the bad smells caused by the secretion of their genitals. End of quotation from Rake. And a typical therapeutic interpretation. Quotation from Rake. A patient was afraid to show me her book. It occurred to me, this patient, who had during the preceding transference shown clear indications of transference love for me, now acts as if the book were a child she had gotten by me. She acts the way a woman does who has to show her child to her husband for the first time. She is afraid he might not like the newborn baby. End of quotation from Rake It reads like a Freudian joke book. Rake's female patients, in contrast, were often touchingly perceptive, even brilliantly astute. They were far more in touch with the reality of their situation than he was ever able to be. Quotation from Rake A woman seems incapable of expressing her strong negative feelings and explains her incapacity in a psychoanalytic session. I am afraid to show these emotions because if I did, it would be like opening Pandora's box. I am afraid that my aggressiveness would destroy all. Before she left I took her to the window and showed her the stores across the street, and their signs in neon letters, and said, isn't it a woman's world? But she was not much impressed by this and replied, walk down Wall Street and you'll see it's a man's world. A patient notes that men are odd. They do not permit us to be only women, I mean women with all their weaknesses, but they do not for a moment let us forget that we are only women. End of quotation from Rake How can these women stand Rake's stupid misogyny? They can't. Quotation from Rake When I told a patient in her forties that she had wanted to be a boy like her brother she began to curse and abuse me, saying fuck you and go to hell, and other unladylike expressions. End of quotation from Rake but the doctor wins. Quotation from Rake When it was time for her to leave, she stood for a while longer than usual before the mirror in my anteroom, putting her hair in order. I smilingly remarked, I am glad to see a remnant of femininity. End of quotation from Rake Here are a few other female reactions. Quotation from Rake When you listen to me a long time without saying anything, I often have the impression that what I say is silly woman's stuff and without value. It is as if you do not consider it worth your while to speak to me.
woman criticizing her psychoanalyst, even your spontaneity is artificial. The patient had been silent for a longer time than usual and then said in a quiet manner, Goddamn, I don't know why I am here. Go fuck yourself. End of quotation from Rake it is not that these women were unaware of their situation, on the contrary, they were in Rake's office because of their awareness. There was no other way to handle their frustration because there is no way to handle it, short of revolution. We have arrived at our final point, the importation of clinical Freudianism to stem the flow of feminism. Girls in the twenties and thirties found themselves halfway in and halfway out of the traditional roles. Thus they were neither insulated and protected from the larger world as before nor were they equipped to deal with it. Both their personal and work lives suffered. Their frustration often took hysterical forms, complicated by the fact that they would despise the world over for even the little false liberation they had achieved. Mass confusion sent them in droves to the psychoanalysts. And where had all the psychoanalysts come from? By this time a war was going on in Europe, and much of the German and Austrian intelligentsia had settled here in search of a practice. It was ideal. A whole class of suffering people awaited them. And it was not just a few bored, rich women who were sucked into the new religion. For America was undergoing serious cramps from withholding a sexual revolution already well beyond the beginning stages. Everyone suffered, men as well as women. Books came out with such titles as How to Live with a Neurotic, because that oppressed class is right there in your kitchen, whining and complaining and nagging. Soon men, too, were turning up at the psychoanalysts. Well educated, responsible citizens, not just psychos. And children. Whole new fields were open to deal with the influx child psychology, clinical psychology, group therapy, marriage counseling services, any variation you can think of, name it and there it was. And none of it was enough. The demand multiplied faster than new departments could be opened up in colleges. That these new departments were soon filled up with women is no wonder. Masses of searching women studied psychology with a passion in the hope of finding a solution to their hang-ups. But women who had grown interested in psychology because its raw material touched them where they lived soon were spouting jargon about marital adjustment and sex role responsibility. Psychology departments became halfway houses to send women scurrying back adjusted to their traditional roles as wives and mothers. Those women who persisted in demanding careers became in their turn instruments of the repressive educational system their newfound psychological insight dash that babble of child psych, social work 301 and L. Ed. Serving to keep a fresh generation of women and children down. Psychology became reactionary to its core, its potential as a serious discipline undermined by its usefulness to those in power. And psychology was not the only new discipline to be corrupted. Education, social work, sociology, anthropology, all the related behavioral sciences, remained for years pseudosciences, overburdened with a double function, the indoctrination of women, as well as the study of human behavior. Reactionary schools of thought developed, social science became functional, studying the operation of institutions only within a given value system, thus promoting acceptance of the status quo. It is not surprising that these remained women's fields. Men soon fled to, exclusively male, pure science, women still only semi-educated, or with their new entrance into academia, were left to be snowed with the pseudo-scientific bullshit. For, in addition to role indoctrination, the behavioral sciences served as a dyke to keep the hordes of questing nouveau intellectuels from entering the real sciences, physics, engineering, biochemistry, etc., sciences that in a technological society bore an increasingly direct relation to control of that society. As a result, even access to higher education, one of the few victories of the early women's rights movement, was subverted. More average women went to college than ever before, with less effect. Often the only difference between the modern college-educated housewife and her traditional prototype was the jargon she used in describing her marital hell. In short, Freudian theory, regroomed for its new function of social adjustment, was used to wipe up the feminist revolt. Patching up with band-aids the casualties of the aborted feminist revolution, it succeeded in quieting the immense social unrest and role confusion that followed in the wake of the first attack on the rigid patriarchal family. 
it is doubtful that the sexual revolution could have remained paralyzed at halfway point for half a century without its help, for the problems stirred up by the first wave of feminism are still not resolved today. D. H. Lawrence and Bernard Shaw are no less relevant than they were in their own time. Wilhelm Reich's The Sexual Revolution could have been written yesterday. Freudianism was the perfect foil for feminism, because, though it struck the same nerve, it had a safety catch that feminism didn't, it never questioned the given reality. While both of their cores are explosive, Freudianism was gradually revised to suit the pragmatic needs of clinical therapy, it became an applied science complete with white-coated technicians, its contents subverted for a reactionary end, the socialization of men and women to an artificial sex role system. But there was just enough left of its original force to serve as a lure for those seeking their way out of oppression, causing Freudianism to go in the public mind from extreme suspicion and dislike to its current status. Psychoanalytic expertise is the final say in everything from marital breakups to criminal court judgments. Thus Freudianism gained the ground that feminism lost, it flourished at the expense of feminism, to the extent that it acted as a container of its shattering force. Only recently have we begun to feel the generations of drugging, half a century later women are waking up. There is a new emphasis on objective social conditions in psychology as well as in the behavioral sciences, these disciplines, only now, decades after the damage has been done, are reacting to their long prostitution with demands for scientific verification, but an end to objectivity and a reintroduction of value judgments. The large numbers of women in these fields may soon start using this fact to their advantage and a therapy that has proven worse than useless may eventually be replaced with the only thing that can do any good, political organization.